Hey, David. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. Thank you. So before we begin, I'd like to just give the listeners a little bit of an idea of who you are. So I've got a quick bio of yours to to read out. Um, and so, you know, you, as oh, you, I'm sure you're well aware, you're a distinguished professor emeritus of biology and anthropology at Bingham University. Uh, you're the president of Pro Social World. Um, and you basically look to apply evolutionary theory and frameworks uh, to multiple different areas outside of, you know, the sort of ordinary biological and scientific spectrum that we might normally associate evolution with, and particularly with regards to cultural evolution. And those are some of the things that, you know, we're going to be talking about today, um, hopefully including some things like, you know, the sort of evolutionary role of altruism and how we can conceptualize working together to promote a cultural evolution, perhaps in a sort of group consciousness uh, type of way. And so thank you very mm-hmm. much for being here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I um, So ma- maybe to begin, uh, how about let's start off with just a, a little question of, you know, in your understanding, why does evolution provide such a, an exemplary framework for conceptualizing a lot of the ideas in the world? Well, the older I get, the more I sort of think of things in historic terms. When we look back on <clears throat> Darwin, you know, that was 160 some years ago. We think that evolution is already called revolutionary, like all the work has been done. But mm-hmm. um, as it turns out, that's only true for biology. And when it comes to all things human, then the relevance of evolution is still very, very much a work in progress. And so whenever I'm in a situation like this, I know that my audience knows almost nothing about what what I'm about. And it's it's not so much me as a person, but it's really just this state of flux in the in the in the history of science that what we already know, this theory which makes so much sense of the living world, can also make just as much sense of our world is Mm -hmm. Um, is what my work represents. And what very, very few people, even people that are extremely open and and well-read in other respects, they just have not encountered this yet. And so this gives me a kind of a passion for for serving a catalytic function and just uh, spreading awareness of this important body of knowledge to people that have not already encountered it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, this world that you speak about, it, is it the sort of human culture, human societies? Uh, is it in terms of that? Yeah, well, it's ourselves as individuals. <laughs> we're, we're very open-ended as individuals. We're not just, we're not determined by our genes, you might, you might say. And that our, our open-ended yeah. quality means that, in a sense, we are evolutionary systems as individuals. And then as cultures, we are open ended. There's just how many hundreds of cultures are there out there? And to think that each one is like an organism is adapted to its environment, like uh, an organism is, well, not many people Mm -hmm. think that way. So just about all the changes in ourselves and in our cultures, and many of these changes are unwanted. In fact, today, I mean, we're living in a, an age of crisis because, because so many of these changes are beyond our, our control. So, so uh, all of that is evolutionary. All of that can be understood in the same way as look outside your window. I look outside my window. I see there's hundreds and hundreds of species outside my window, trees, plants, birds, insects. Um, all of them are products of evolution. And we know that. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what... We know if you're a biologist, but to have that degree of understanding for everything else around us, that's again what's new. Right. And there's also this weird dynamic in, you know, sort of human thought where we think of ourselves typically as separate from nature and the natural world, right? As if we don't fall into the exact same categories as any other animal with you know, a sort of more evolved brain in in some regards. And maybe that's to do with something to do with like the idea of, you know, human agency 
And so that sort of ties in this notion of like conscious evolution, right? Where we get to now start making choices about how we're going to evolve both ourselves and our groups and our societies. Um, you know, how do you sort of see that play a role here? Well, curiously enough, um, you're right that there's a huge tendency to think of ourselves as set apart from other species. And most of those attempts have, have failed. We're definitely a part of nature. And yet in one respect, we are indeed either very highly distinctive or maybe even unique. And that is our capacity for symbolic thought, for symbolic mm. thought. Uh, other species, they evolve by genetic evolution. They do have cultures. In fact, cultural traditions in other species is a wonderful, wonderful topic. But this mm -hmm. capacity for a mental world, which is kind of detached from the environment, the ideas in our head, the way we see the world, it does not exactly correspond to the world, but it adapts us to our world in the same way as our genes. This is called dual inheritance theory, by the way. Two streams of inheritance, a genetic stream and a symbolic stream. And that, that symbolic stream is very distinctive, in part because it requires so much cooperation. So to get another important concept on the table here, yeah. we are another thing that makes us uh, quite distinct especially against the background of our primate relatives, is the degree to which we are able to cooperate, at least within groups. Uh, what those groups mm -hmm. do to other groups is another matter. So we got cooperation, we get symbolic thought. These are two things that, that make us quite distinctive. But of course, we're never set apart from nature. We're always within nature, and, and we're, we're uh, products of evolution. We never escape that. Yeah, and we couldn't survive without nature, right? Even just, let's say, the atmosphere that we're breathing or the food that we eat, um, it's all a part of our need to survive and, and continue in our own lives and, you know, sort of to think ourselves as separate, um, while understandable for those reasons, appears to, to be a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the sort of dual inheritance theory is very interesting because from what I'm understanding, what you're saying is it's like, our capacity to have mental representations of the world uh, allow us to in in some manner engage in you know projective thinking about ourselves or the future or the past and learn from that and adapt and make plans instead of you know more other mammal or mammalian or insect species that just basically act out everything right and so that really raises the level to which we can think and discuss, particularly between each other, the best ways of doing things and the ways we can be best adapted to the sort of changing environment. Is that kind of what you're saying? It is, um, uh, Shane, but let me elaborate on it a bit and make a, a point hmm. that needs to be made both for biological evolution and for human evolution, and our own meaning systems, which is what you were discussing just uh, in your most recent words. And the point to make is that evolution doesn't make everything nice. Very often we think that there's harmony in nature, that nature left to itself achieves some kind of a balance. We write a lot of goodness into nature, and often into indigenous societies, as if they're good and somehow we've, we've um, spoiled spoil things. Uh, but um, when, you look at, when you look at other species, uh, other social species, might be primates or other species, uh, very often they're horribly despotic in human terms. And so evolution, often it results in outcomes that benefit me, not you, forms of selfishness, us, not them, where selfishness mm -hmm. is a group level trait, our short-term benefit, but not for the long view. Much of nature is like this. And so now goodness, what we call goodness in all its forms, um, altruism, all forms of extending yourself for, uh, towards others, can evolve, but only when special conditions are met. That's the take-home. That's the, that's the um, uh, take-home. We need to identify those special conditions and then bring them 
about. And all of what I've just said for biological evolution also goes for uh, cultural evolution and our own personal evolution. So we're a product of evolution, that's for sure. And our meaning systems are like our genes. But what do they cause us to do? Often they cause us to benefit ourselves at the expense of those around us. Mm -hmm. Or our groups at the expense of other groups. Often they, they satisfy our short-term needs at the expense of the long view. And of course, all of the problems that we associate, especially such things as global warming and destruction of the earth and so on, are, are examples of things that are actually successful in the evolutionary sense of the word. Um, in other words, they help us survive and reproduce better than the other things we might do, but not in a way that leads to long-term welfare, even for us as individuals. And so for that reason, we need to, to become conscious about our evolution uh, and not just leave it to the what, what you know, B.F. Skinner called reinforce, reinforcers um, um, shaping our, our behavior. So we must take a kind of a conscious control of our evolution at all, at all levels, individuals, our groups, all the way up to the whole earth. The degree to which this has to be um, stewarded, I think, is the most benign word mm -hmm. because there's all kinds of issues of control that get raised and and so it gets very complicated, very messy ethically. Yeah, but so perhaps a, a good point here is to, if we look at what we are talking about when we say culture, right, and how that impacts and influences an individual, um, what, what exactly do you mean by that? And, you know, to what degree is an individual, and perhaps this is a second question, but to what degree are we as individuals responsible for the change or the existing state and then the potential to change our culture that we live in at any sort of level, right? Small group or bigger group or civilization as a whole, right? Yeah, so I mean, when it comes to our control over this, it's like a glass half full and half empty or part full, part empty. You gotta be impressed by both of them. Uh, to some extent, uh, we imagine our futures, and then we cause those to become uh, reality to a remarkable extent. And the whole the whole distinction between fact and fiction becomes blurred. I was I was just so much reminded of this when I wrote my first work of fiction, Atlas Hugged. Um, so, but like any storyteller, especially a novelist who writes a story at length, you create this and an amazing imaginary world, but, but it's a world you want to become a reality. And then you work to make it a reality, and to some extent, that happens. Mm -hmm. And so fiction literally becomes fact. It is said that you know Uncle Tom's Cabin by, by Stowe is like one of the most impactful books in American history because it caused slaves to be humanized. And then and then that contributed to the abolition of slavery. Fiction became fact. So, so and yet, and yet, uh, so much of human cultural evolution is blind. And even when we attempt to consciously uh, uh, manage it, often there's unforeseen consequences. Your intentions collide with my intentions. And at the end of the day, it's just like a thousand inadvertent social experiments, and some hang together better than. Um, yeah. Uh, better than uh, better than others. So glass is half full, half half empty. So it's it's about sort of managing that right at at each stage of change. Because while we want to bring in a good you know world that we envision in in some capacity, uh, fictionally you might say in story or in um, myth. You know historically we could look at it that way, or, or in religious text and things like that. Um, but we are limited in our capacity, particularly as individuals, to see the whole picture and all the parts functioning and what the total consequences of these kinds of actions are. And, and so we strive to do good things. And yet at the same time, a whole bunch of 
bad things, you know, quote unquote, bad things happen as well that we then have to manage and deal with, right? Um, it, yeah, does this that, becomes is a basis kind of for therapy. Saying? So I've been, you know, yeah. in my long life, <laughs> I can say things like not that now I'm in my 70s, I can say in my long life. <laughs> uh, uh, I've worked with some amazing yeah. people. And, um, and one of them is named Stephen C. Hayes. Uh, he's a rock star in his world, which is mindfulness-based therapy. Others, of course, yeah. don't know him at all. That reveals uh, one of my favorite themes is like an archipelago of knowledge and practice. Life consists of uh, many, many isolated islands of thought and practice uh, with little communication among islands. So I could name any famous personage, Steve Hayes, Eleanor Ostrom, Edward O. Wilson, and that person might need no introduction to you, or yeah. you might never have heard of that uh, person. But Steve Hayes is the founder of something called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy or training. Yeah. And, um, and increasingly, we're thinking of it as a form of managed evolution. I could make my main points, um, and I often do, just by imagine, you know, it's December 31st, and you've just made your New Year's resolution. New Year's resolutions. <laughs> These are your aspirations for yourself. Yeah. How often do you keep those resolutions? <laughs> um, <laughs> few people do. So why is it that we might aspire to do something and yet typically fail? That's how, that's how hard it is. And then mm -hmm. when you look at what you, do, what you end up doing, often those end up, when you look at them, uh, they end up being clearly adaptive in a, in a kind of a limited sense of the word. So you might want a great relationship with your partner, but you also might want to control them. Uh, you might worry that they might leave you, and so therefore you might want to um, uh, control them. Um, on and on like that. So we behave defensively or aggressively. It gets us something in a very limited sense, but not in any kind of broad sort of sense. So what therapy becomes, or training, becomes a way to, to be more mindful, to use that word, <laughs> about basically establishing targets of selection, which is your aspirations. Think of it as a target of selection. Mm -hmm. Orient variation around that target. There's variation. And then work towards accomplishing those goals. You can begin to see it as a form of a of a form of a, an evolutionary process with selection, variation, and mm -hmm. the replication of best practices. That's the trio of Darwinian evolution. Any process that includes variation, selection, and replication is a Darwinian process. Right, and that makes a lot of sense from a psychological perspective where you're sort of weeding out the things that don't work and you're selecting for, but consciously to perhaps a large degree, selecting for the most beneficial thing that you can think of at that time for yourself, let's say, and then you know, in order to achieve that, you got to work with the conditions of your own, you know, psychophysiology, um, and replicate your um, those thoughts or ideas, perhaps, uh, or psychological systems. I suppose it depends on how you want to frame it, and then that's how you sort of select to move towards a particular goal that you deem to be of more benefit to the current situation that you live in. Right. Is, is that, does that align with what yeah. you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I love the, uh, <clears throat> first let me emphasize how successful this is mm. and then take a step uh, beyond it. But uh, it's very science based. And I, let me describe two of the studies that, uh, sure. three of the studies that, um, that demonstrate this. It turns out that there's like over 800 randomized control trials demonstrating the efficacy of this. So what your what your audience what our audience needs to know is science says this is true. So here's three <laughs> examples of yeah. um, of what that uh, means. Um, in the first place, people vary uh, in how adaptable they are this way, uh, just without any training or coaching or anything. There's just variation. The bell-shaped curve. Some people are really good at this. They didn't have to be taught. Other people are horrible at it, and most of us are somewhere 
in between. And what one study showed is that um, although we all, all of us have adverse experiences, so that's just part of life, but how much that affects your mental health depends very much on where you are in that bell-shaped curve. And if you're adaptable, then you basically are able to roll with the punches. Some, something bad happens and you can overcome it and you can keep on your, on your, um, on your path. So there's uh, natural variation. Uh, the study showed that. And the study showed the, the importance of being flexible in that way. And now it's coachable. Uh, mm. You can teach this, no problem. Uh, in fact, uh, in the next study I'll mention, uh, only 15 minutes of training was required. 15 minutes of training. Mm. And this study was done on couples. It was a really well done study in, in, in Switzerland. Some couples, both members received the training. In other couples, one member received the training. And in the third, neither couple received the training. And then what the study did was monitor how they behave towards each other at random times during the day. At any particular point, you might be signaled on your, on your device, and then you would input a little information about how your relationship was, was going. And then after a while, they had them play an experimental economics game where you can choose to be nice or not to your, to your um, uh, partner. And what that study showed was that um, the um, couples that both received training uh, were nicer to each other. Their relationship had had improved uh, compared to the uh, couples where neither had received training and the couples where one had received training, they were in between. And so mm -hmm. that was 15 minutes of training called a micro-intervention. And then the third study was called so Bibliotherapy. Just to pause you there. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what was the... Uh, nature of that that 15 minute training it, you you said adaptability training but is that like resilience training or is it um, openness or mindfulness what exactly are they training people to do there well it's called i mean the the key words acceptance and commitment uh, oh it was part of the act it. paradigm yep it was part of the act oh, okay paradigm and what that means is first of all you have to have your target of selection what are you trying to do Keep it in your mind. You're trying to have a good relationship with your partner, okay? Now, the other thing is, now look at the obstacles. Look at, look at what you're doing that take you away from that as opposed to towards it. Don't ignore that. And then, after you accept that, then you commit to working towards your valued goals. That's accept and commit. So that is, right. in a, in a, and you could convey that in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that is the, that's what it is. In a, right. And a large part of that show. would be mindfulness, right? The capacity to be aware of what your goals are, where you're sort of fumbling, hitting roadblocks and being okay with that and then managing to navigate around it, right? Whereas with an unconscious yeah. view of it, it's very hard or impossible to do. Right, you're just sort of acting one thing next to the next. Right, yeah, and then when we, you know, when you really dive into this, uh, Shane, you find that there's more than one kind of mindfulness. Uh, some of them sure. are actually not effective. Uh, there's a distinction between hmm. uh, cognitive and behavior therapy and mindfulness cognitive and behavioral <laughs> therapy. And sometimes when you focus on your problems, it has the opposite effect. You become mired. Uh, yeah in them. And so there's, there's quite a few flavors of this and some work better than, some work better than, um, um, uh, other. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's that complicated. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, so yeah, so the, the third study you, you were mentioning was on bibliotherapy. Yeah. So this just involves reading a book on ACT and working through its exercises. Uh, the mm -hmm. participants were public school teachers who were experiencing burnout basically. And it was what's called a uh, waitlisted trial, which meant that you divide the teachers into two groups at random. First group reads the book immediately, and then you do, you know, pre, post, and follow up. Yeah. Then the other group starts later, and you get pre, post, follow up. And so you know that when the improvement is only after they read the book, then you know that the book is very causative. Um, 
agent. And so you right. know, just reading the book had about a third of the effect of actually seeing a, a real therapist or trainer. But the best part of the study hmm. that I always like to point out is that the between the post and the follow-up. So in post, you've read the book and you're, you've improved. And then there's like a one month period between the post and the follow-up. Nothing happened, mm -hmm. but actually they got still better. They got still better. They could have stayed the same. They could have relapsed, but they got still better. And so what that means is, is that reading the book had changed them. What was inside their head was different now. Their yeah. symbotype has changed. The evolution had occurred in their meaning system, and they were practicing and they were still improving. So evolutionary change had taken place. What was inside their heads was different than before, hmm. and it was a lasting change. So that's what personal evolution means. The differences in the way you see the world, basically and thinking of them as as a kind of evolution, a much faster wow. form than genetic evolution. It's fascinating. It's very, very That's deep. amazing. Yeah. And it, it's I, also... I believe it's amazing. Yeah, I, 100%. And it, it also, at least to me, it, it seems intuitively right, right? At least in the sense of like, with the new aggregate of information and experience, your world changes, how you see things change. Right. So it, it's not just a change in you, but it's also a change in the world around you, because once you can start to see things in new ways, because you're looking through a new lens, maybe is a, a, quite a good analogy, then you start to see more of the world through that particular lens. Right. And, and that's kind of the sort of theory of um, how our psychological frameworks make up the world that we you know, engage in. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in some ways, it's a redescription of the way we talk about it all the time. But there's something mm -hmm. very powerful about being more explicit <laughs> about yeah. our... And that's why Steve and I, along with two colleagues, Tony Biglin and Dennis Embry, coined the term symbotype, mm. just to stress the comparison with uh, uh, genotype. All of us have a collection of genes we call that our genotype. Those genes influence just about everything that could be measured about us. We call that our phenotype. All of us mm -hmm. also have a, a symbotype, a collection of symbols, which also influence that very same phenotype. Just about everything could be measured in us. And our symbotype and genotype interact with each other. Uh, that's what epigenetics is all about, the upregulation and downregulation of our genes. You take a course in meditation, and, yeah. um, and it actually changes your gene expression. So there's that. And then, of hmm. course, they've been co-evolving with each other uh, throughout our, our very capacity to have symbotypes as a product of genetic evolution. So there's like a long genetic story to be told. And wow. there's also a story about what's taking place all around us in real time. Hmm. And so is the symbotype... Um it's okay. So, so the symbotype is a third category that that you've established, right? And now, just like genotype expresses in phenotypes, do symbo um, symbotypes do they express also in a phenotypical way, or is is there a fourth sort of category? Nope, it's the same phenotype. A phenotype is just a word it's for anything same. that I can measure about you. Anything I can oh, measure I about okay. you. <laughs> is your phenotype. And the phenotype is being influenced by both your genotype and your uh, symbotype. Your symbotype has, you know, the largest effect. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not that you have to compare them. They're both huge and they're intertwined and things like that. But the important thing is, is that um, there's another point to get across. Uh, and I know that <laughs> I always worry that I'm like, you know, being like a fire hose in a conversation no. like this, just drenching <laughs> good. people with... Um, uh, uh, with all of this, but if you, and I have such a advantage, I feel, by being trained as an evolutionary biologist. I started out as an aquatic ecologist. I studied zooplankton, mm. for heaven's sakes. And so for much of my <laughs> career, I was actually studying non-human species. And I'm just familiar with the whole way that, that um, 
that evolution has developed in in biology. But um, so in biology, in any species, um, is what's called phenotypic plasticity. What's that? It means that we don't just you know the, the way we are, what you can measure about ourselves, our phenotype. They're very responsive to their environment. So an mm. organism with a single set of genes has the capacity to be flexible, to do this in that situation, to do that in that situation. So every organism has a repertoire of behaviors that they display in response to the environment. And our symbotypes are like that also. So whatever is inside your head at this moment gives you a, a repertoire, a degree of flexibility. You can behave this way under that circumstance, that way under another circumstance. Yeah. So every single symbotype results in a in a repertoire which might be working well or poorly for you. Right. Um, if you want depending to go beyond on the that situation. repertoire, depending on the situation, if you want to go beyond that repertoire, that requires symbotypic change. Just like if you want to go beyond your genetic repertoire, that requires genetic change. Mm. And so, so yes, we have a, a degree of flexibility uh, in our current state, but if you want to go beyond that repertoire, then some kind of internal change is required. You have to change what's on the inside in order to change how you behave on the outside. That's where right. inner work is, is required. Hmm. And that's much more accessible than, let's say, genetic uh, repertoire adjustments. Yeah, right? forget about genetic engineering for the moment. I mean, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, We're that's an away interesting from that. topic too. But for the most part, you know, yeah, think, th think about your symbol type first. That's a hmm. lot easier. And it's also constantly changing, right? Even if you're not actively trying to do it because the world's always changing and you're being put into new environments, learning new information, uh, adding to your symb symbotopic repertoire uh, and therefore changing yourself from the inside, uh, even if you don't want to sometimes, right? Particularly in crisis situations, I'm, I'm imagining where all of a sudden this completely new situation has arisen that you have to deal with. And you're going to rely on your symbo, uh, symbotypic re repertoire primarily, but also then you might need to learn new things in order to adapt to be able to survive in these new conditions for the duration of it, it, it you know, in order to survive. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the whole question is like, am I the same person now that I was back then? Yeah. Um, at some earlier point in my lifetime, can I become a different person um, in the future? To the extent that we're an open-ended evolutionary process, the answer is absolutely yes. And mm -hmm. often in ways that you don't intend. Stuff happens to you when you become a different person to the extent that you're an open-ended process. You could become a worse person. Very easily can you become a, a worse uh, right. person. And that's what it means to be an open-ended evolutionary process. Now, some things are more static. I mean, you're dealt, your genes are dealt like a deck of cards. <laughs> you can't change them. Um, some yeah. early life experiences, it's stuff that just happened. You can't change that easier. So we're not just like total chameleon. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, yeah, we are like total chameleons. Yeah. And, so, and so to that degree, we can become... A different person, and I think myself that way. In my in my memoir that I recently wrote, there's a section which says, you know, I become a different person, and, and that person is a more spiritual person. Mm -hmm. We can talk about what the, what that means because of because of some kind of journey I went on, and of course that's yeah. how spiritual people talk. So and yeah, it kind of authorizes it kind of authorizes the way we often talk. Anyhow, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't use the E word or anything, but this kind of authorizes the idea that we could be on a journey, we can change, we're not, we can shed an old skin. I mean, all of these things become uh, sensible right? Uh, from and an we evolutionary perspective. Yeah, and what's interesting is humans, we, we seem to have this impulse to be better all the time, right? And it's a very curious 
to me at least, I don't quite understand why that's the case of, you know, you take anyone who I've encountered in my life and you sort of ask them like, are you perfectly happy with everything about yourself that you might have some possibility of changing, right? Obviously there's some things you can't change and that's a different story, but just in terms of behavior and, um, well, I guess we can just look at behavior or thought processes as well everyone's always trying to be like, okay, well, I could improve this. I didn't do this so well. Maybe next time I'll do it better. Uh, You know, there doesn't seem to be a place where we're like, this is the final best version of me that can sustain forwards. And perhaps that's because environments are always changing. And so we need to be able to do that and strive for better adaptation and survivability. What do you make of that? Well, this is a good opportunity to uh, uh, push back against that a, a little bit, about, believe it or not, sure. and to emphasize uh, cultural diversity, including diversity in that kind of way of thinking. And there's an acronym, I'd be interested to know if you've heard it. Uh, the acronym is WEIRD, which stands for Western Educated Industrial Rich and Democratic. So you are weird, I tell you, and so am I. Um, And it was coined by someone named Joseph Henrik, who's a professor at Harvard University with some colleagues. And Joe has a book a couple years old now called The Weirdest People in the World. Hmm. And what the book shows and what it draws upon a literature, which one one of the one of the big take home messages of this is that if cultural evolution is an evolutionary process, then we should be thinking about cultural diversity the way we do biological diversity. Think of, for example, Mm. the adaptive radiations of the major vertebrate lineages, such as all of the fish, all of the birds, all of the reptiles, how many different species occupying different ecological niches. Now think of human cultures that way. all climatic zones, dozens of ecological niches. Some some cultures harvest seeds, other cultures harvest whales. Um, some cultures in, inhabit environments which do not change. The idea that their environment changes so very fast, well, that's true now, but it was not true mm. in the past. There, there have been times in which every generation was much like the one that preceded it. Right. And so we should... Um, um, what the weird acronym tells us is don't presume that the way that weird people think is, is like human nature. Uh, the idea that like there's a genetically evolved human nature and then some thin veneer of cultural variation is painted on top of that, that's what's being questioned. And, mm-hmm. so, and so in cultures that are um, less... Uh, changing and are also more collective, um, then people don't think of themselves as individuals. The whole concept of individuality might be something which people don't uh, I think that way. Analytic thought, the, the way we think in terms of um, analytically is something that really depends upon written language, the ability to write things down. If, if, if you are in a an entirely oral culture where everything known has to be remembered and somehow passed ahead. That just forces a different kind of thought. We, do, we have to study that mm. as scientists. We, don't, we can't even fathom what that's like on the basis of our own experience. And so I think that what you described, I can't prove it, but I'm guessing, is pretty weird. And that we shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be assuming we have, we have to... Actually, this has to be an object of scientific inquiry. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, that's my pushback against the idea that we're all like that. No, I, I think that's a very good point, actually, because it's true. I, I was sort of making the assumption that, you know, if I have this impulse and so does everyone around me, then that's a representation of human impulses in general. And But you're absolutely right. You just take any sort of culture that is relatively or distantly connected from Western civilizations and it they are they're different worlds and they think differently and 
so it it needs to be sort of studied and so yeah that that's a fair fair criticism um and i, I guess it's true the further back in time you look the more true it is in terms of how things didn't change that much one generation to the next whereas in in modern times for much of the world um, each generation's world is very different specifically with technology right that's it just changes everything um, and yeah. we don't really know exactly yeah. how and that you know, has impacts i find that that uh, when i have talks like this and by the way i'm having a great time i hope that you are too yeah um uh, i uh I find myself drawing upon this book a lot, uh, Sand Talk, mm. um, How Indigenous Thinking Can Change the World by Tyson Yunkaporta, who is a, of a Australian Aboriginal um, a descent. And so it speaks to this. And uh, if I could quote a passage, then I'll elaborate on the, on the passage. Um, yeah. And he's talking about uh, a folk figure of the emu. You know, the emu, um, I guess, what's that insurance company where we've all... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, but I know the uh, emu animal, uh, very strange, but right. and cool so, creature. And so, uh, and so he says, uh, emu is a troublemaker who brings into being the most destructive idea in existence. I am greater than you. You are less than me. This is the source of all human misery. Aboriginal society was designed over thousands of years to deal with this problem. Some people are just idiots, and everybody has a bit of idiot in them from time to time. It's coming from some deep place inside that whispers, you are special, you are greater than other people and things, you are more important than everything and everyone. All things and all people exist to serve you. This behavior needs massive checks and balances to contain the damage um, that it can do. There's a lot of stories that explain how all this began. And as a Brolga boy, traditional enemy of Emu, I know them all. My favorite comes from Noongar elder Noel Nanup in Perth, who tells the dreaming story of a meeting in which all of the species sat down for a yarn to, de to decide which one would be the custodial species for all of creation. Emu made a hell of a mess running around, showing off his speed, and claiming his superiority, demanding to be boss and shouting over everyone. You can see the dark shape of Emu in the Milky Way. Kangaroo, his head is the head of the Southern Cross, is holding him down. Echidna is grasping him from behind, and the great serpent is coiled around his leg. Containing the excesses of malignant narcissists is a mm. team effort. Now, the reason I quoted that at such length mm is that what that identifies, not only as something inherent to Aborigine, uh, indigenous life, it's a, a fundamental problem of social behavior in all of its forms. And so when you talked earlier about everyone kind of having a well-meaning side of them, they want to make things better for themselves and others in a kind of an aspirational sense. Yeah, true, but they also have the emu side to them. We all right. do, just like the you dark said. Side. Evolution tells us that, too. And so for society to work well, there has to be those checks and balances that, that Tyson describes for Aboriginal society. It has to be true mm -hmm. for all society. And what you see in modern society is narcissism running amok. You see the emu problem. Mm -hmm. Everywhere we turn, we see the yeah. emu problem. That's something that we need to solve and what evolution can help us, can help us first of all, see that problem and then to work about solving it. Right. And so the narcissistic tendency that, as you say, is running amok, which is plainly evident. Um, I suppose you just need to look around. And it, it's often, at least in a lot of Western societies, um, encouraged and celebrated to some degree, right? And that's not such a good thing, or I suppose it depends on what the person does with their successes and things like that. You know, is it a sort of benefit conferral or um, are they doing good for the rest of the society as well? But so 
what would you say is the antidote to that? Well, it's here that we can take uh, the ideas that we've been discussing on the personal plane mm. with uh, such things as acceptance and commitment therapy and start to expand the view and to think about entire worldviews and ideologies this way. We could talk about the Enlightenment. Uh, we can talk about the kind of worldview that existed, for example, in aristocratic societies, such as uh, you know France before the uh, uh, Enlightenment. Revolution. How is the person in relationship to society thought about? And then mm. the kind of individualism associated with the Enlightenment. We can think of neoclassical economics. Um, and the concept of the invisible hand as a kind of a symbol type, uh, which is causes us to do um, uh, uh, certain things. And so this is now cultural evolution at a larger scale. And we can see, to take the case of, uh, of economics, uh, although it's done lots of good things, make no mistake, I mean, it really justifies emu-like behavior. It pretends that we could all run around like emus, and the invisible hand is going to make it come out right. That's what it says. Mm. And that's what, you know, greed is good. Uh, the only responsibility of a business is to make profits for its shareholders. This is all received wisdom. This has all become normative. And what it does is it licenses emu-like behavior. And so we need to change the symbotype at that scale. We need to basically very decisively reject much of what we've been holding dear, especially mm. in in uh, American and Anglophone uh, economics and replace it with something else. That something is not socialism. Socialism fails also. And so it's, it's really close among modern governance to the social democracies of uh, Scandinavia that's um, when we look at, um, at modern social and economic systems. We do have good models. There's books like uh, Why Nations Fail by um, Darren Asimoglu and, and his, um, I always forget the first name of his uh, co-author, Williamson, uh, which show how nations vary and how well mm -hmm. they, they function and explains pretty well that the, the best functioning nations have solved the emu problem. They're inclusive. They manage to work for the benefit of everyone. So we have a lot of standing variation to understand and to study and to select upon and to improve. It's basically it's it's um, conscious cultural evolution at a higher at a higher scale, working on whole whole. Um, economic and social scientific worldviews. Right. Now, do you think that this kind of transformation that we need is achievable or perhaps best achievable from the ground up or from the top down? Like, do you think it's best to get all the people, the, like a grassroots approach, transform it at the individual level that will then manifest in our, you know, social structures and, and um, political uh, ideals, or is it something that can work if you sort of take it top down and you go for the policy making, um, you know, business practices, and then sort of make people just fall into this new structure? Uh, the answer is both. So, uh, I mean, both in a big way. And so first, let me emphasize the bottom up. And then the top down. But right away, we have to insert the word multi-level, multi-level. It's not just bottom and top. It's a mm. multi-tier. And we see this already in governance uh, federalism. I mean, why is it that we have governance at so many scales? We've got the nation, we've got the state, we've got the cities, we've got the counties, all the way down. Yeah. Um, the Catholic Church has what's called subsidiarity. Um, lower level units have a kind of an authority as long as they're not causing problems higher up the scale then the, the smaller units um, should uh, should do what they want and then top down uh, should be applied very selectively so these are some of the models of governance that have evolved by cultural evolution because they're 
absolutely required. Uh, but there's a mm -hmm. missing link in multi-level formal governance at the smaller scale, and that is the the very small groups of people that are trying to work together to get things done every day of our lives. If I were to ask you to list all of the groups in your life at that scale, your family, your neighborhood, your school, your business, your sports team, I mean, so many things get done at that scale. It's below the level of even the smallest scale of formal uh, governance. And that mm -hmm. we should be thinking of as one of the most natural human social units. This is where evolution goes beyond individualism. Individualism, which is just so pervasive that it's the proverbial water that the fish can't see. We're just without thinking about it anymore. We think of the individual person as some kind of fundamental unit. And mm -hmm. what evolution tells us is that no, actually, People never lived alone throughout their entire history as a species. We always lived in the context of small and, for the most part, highly cooperative groups. And those groups have been regulated in the same way as to solve the emu problem. And so when you look yeah. at small groups that function well, they exemplify what Tyson was talking about there. And it's there where we need to uh, thrive. As we were talking earlier about acceptance and commitment therapy, and you were giving actually a very nice account of it, a description of what the individual might do as an individual unit. If you mm -hmm. were to revisit that part of our conversation and say, imagine if a small group committed to that, to having some aspirational right. goal and to recognizing the obstacles and, and helping each other work around the obstacle. A small group is going to do that much better than an individual. An individual is not a regulatory unit. To force an individual to be a self-sufficient regulatory unit is asking too much. And so mm -hmm. the idea that we should be organizing our lives in cells and working on those cells to, that is, in the first place, it's straightforward. I didn't say anything that's hard to understand. And it makes great sense. But yeah. It is radically new. It is radically new to work. If, if, if that's what we mean by bottom up, then, and it is what I mean by bottom up. Well, there's a whole just worldwide project working at that scale. But at the same time, that has to be integrated with all those other levels that I was talking mm -hmm. about, all the way up to the global scale and so and so that is the whole project which is which is bottom up top down and multi and multi level is what is uh, what is required and nothing le nothing less will do so yeah. it's inherently multi level and now i mean that all makes complete sense and you're absolutely right you know how we're evolved to be social creatures particularly cooperative social creatures within relatively small groups and um, that we're way more capable in a group context and you can see this just you just look around and you see what let's say a company is able to do as a unit rather than an individual trying to do all of the things I mean it makes sense right you need teams of people with expertise in all sorts of areas to come up with you know fantastic ideas and as sometimes it goes wrong and sometimes those things are dangerous and cause a lot of problems but they can also do a lot of good things and but my question is um how given the variability of of human nature not human nature of let's say human societies or groups right that have potentially conflicting interests right how how does this kind of approach account for that or or what's the strategy to manage that because I don't, you know, I, I don't know, and this is not, I'm not making a claim here, but surely not everyone has the same goals or ideas about what the right answer to this would be. Yeah, and so first let me address that in a, in a 
for smaller groups. Yeah. And then at a larger um, at a larger scale. And I don't. I'm not naive. I don't underestimate the problems involved in this. But at the same time, I'm optimistic. In fact, I'm quite highly um, optimistic and feel justified in my um, in my uh, optimist optimism. Uh, one point to make is that we're such a cultural species that almost all of our groups are socially constructed. Almost all of our groups are socially constructed. Pick any group, mm -hmm. including the idea that the whole world is a group, our nation is a group, our religion is a group, all the way to our smaller groups, my family, my school, all of this is socially constructed. And right. so, uh, so there's that. And so now imagine a group, one of these small groups, uh, that um, it could be a small business. And, okay, well, can we come together at that level? Can we agree, for example, when we, and there's, a, there's almost like a checklist of design features to make a group function well. And the, at the top of the checklist is a strong sense of identity and purpose. Does this group that brings us together have a strong sense of identity and purpose. Why does it exist? Mm -hmm. Why should it be important to us? Why is it worth our time and effort? Now, if you could get a group of people, the group of people that have been that that are members of that group, to agree on that, mm -hmm. then other differences recede into the background. Right. Uh, for the purposes of being in the group. They might be different in many other ways, and those differences won't go away. They'll rise to the fore in other contexts. But in the context of that group, we are united in our sense of purpose. And then we're structured in other ways, which more or less solve the emu problem and all of, all of that. That you mm. can do. That you can do. And you could also expand it. So, and then ultimately what you want to do is to have a whole earth ethic. You can say, first and foremost, we are human beings and citizens of the earth. Whatever else we might be, we're all that. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama, that's exactly what he says. You know, if you listen to him and his book, um, uh, Beyond Religion, Towards an Ethics, for the whole um, whole world, mm -hmm. he says there's nearly eight billion people on this planet, and they will never come together uh, under any single religion. And about a billion of them aren't religious at all, he says. And so, given that, what are we going to do? We have to create an ethics for the whole world, and that requires, first of all, seeing the whole world as a the salient group, and mm -hmm. then as citizens of that world, that's the primary thing. Now, we also have a national identity and a religious identity, ethnic, all of that kind of stuff. Yes, we have all that, and because life is multi-level, we, we, we can't ignore that, but we have to coordinate it. So when we're operating in these other capacities, it always has to be with the highest good in mind. We have to be, ask, we have to be asking the question, if this is benefiting me or us, is it doing harm someplace else in the system? And if mm -hmm. it is doing harm, that's not okay. We don't rely on the invisible hand to fix that, because there is no invisible hand other than the one that we that we create. And so it's at that point that we examined our actions at all scales with the higher good in mind. And that is not only is that possible, but increasingly it's the only thing that makes sense. Because I think the world has become so global mm -hmm. uh, in a chaotic way. Uh, yeah. That, but we can't help but see that. And one way I like to point that out is that in my city of Binghamton, New York, which is a tiny, tiny city in upstate New York, um, over 20 first languages are spoken in the public school. That's wow. how much global mixing is. So in the first place, we have things like Zoom, where I'm, where are you located? 
Canada, Toronto. Yeah, so here we are together, yeah. although physically distant. So we know that there's only one world that way. If I just pick a person that's physically next to me, that person could come from any place on yeah. Earth. We know that our oil is coming from Russia. That's why our gas prices are are yeah. high. And so, like, it's become two or three centuries ago. It was unimaginable. Nobody thought about the whole Earth as a as the group three hundred years ago. And now it's the only thing that makes sense. And so, yeah. And so, there you go. No, absolutely, and. Every country is connected to the rest of the world, at least in the sense of a global economy and, you know, resource sharing and the purchasing and trade and all kinds of things. And although we don't exactly know how to navigate that space yet uh, because it's so new, um, there's a lot of good and bad things that are coming of it. And so I, I really get what you're saying about this need for a, it's almost like a global ideal for which we can all work yeah. towards, yeah. right? The highest good. And defining that is um, perhaps complicated, uh, but it's worth doing, right? It, it's, a, it's an endeavor that needs to be done because otherwise we just and, we're left with conflict and strife. And what's taking place in the Ukraine now is um, mm. so very interesting this way. It's tragic and it could become much more tragic. But what could be happening is Basically, uh, solving the emu problem at the global scale. If you think of Putin as emu, yeah, running amok, and then the mm -hmm. rest of the world, without resorting, is basically trying to constrain emu, and maybe might succeed. Maybe yeah. might succeed, and so that kind of predatory action, which was the norm. Two and three hundred years ago happened all the time. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that kind of emu dynamic, um, you know, it takes a village to control the emu. Well, maybe the global village is actually getting together. That, that includes like the nations, the corporations, even people like Absolutely. individual hackers and the like. I mean, um, yeah. just maybe. Just maybe the uh, uh, it'll take the global village to to uh, constrain the emu. That could be happening. Yeah. And so it does seem to be the well, I mean, the verdict is yeah. still out. It could go really bad. But uh, but, yeah. uh, but that's what <laughs> let's we, hope that doesn't. And happen. of course, to see it that way, Shane, to see it that way. Um, to see it clearly as that's what's needed is something that this mm -hmm. worldview um, does very well, just to see things mm -hmm. as they are. If you were like a you know, traditional economist, uh, yeah. your whole way of seeing things would be, would be, uh, would be different. So this also speaks to the, to the symbotypic aspect that... Uh, um, with the symbotype provided by this multi-level evolutionary worldview, you just uh, you see it more clearly. So, mm -hmm. and that's a huge advantage all by itself. Absolutely, and it, it has been amazing to see the response from the world at all of these multi-levels to the situation between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and to see the amount of support for Ukraine and Ukrainian people and the sort of sanctions against Russia from even just individual corporations and the backlash that companies who don't do that get from the people mm -hmm. in the world, it really highlights this point that you're, that you're making of that is where we're headed. Even though we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, as a global community, it's like, well, we don't tolerate that shit anymore. Um, and, now, and it's what happens. It, it's it's yeah. what happens every day on a smaller scale. If you shrunk the whole thing down to a small group, and there was some guy yep. who was just really being an asshole, and then and just breaking some norm that everyone else in the group had, that you just pile onto that person. Yeah. And 
and um, that would be that. So, so it's really a matter of scaling up. It's so very familiar at a mm. small scale, and then the fact that it's it it is so that the basic logic of social control is so multi-level means that we can take something that is just not just deeply familiar but deeply practiced at a uh, at a small scale, and that becomes mm -hmm. the blueprint for what's needed. Nothing more and nothing less is what's yeah. needed at the larger scale. We know what to do. It's yeah. just a matter of scaling up. So that's what, uh, that's what conceptually, it has a simplicity, which is just uh, amazing. Yeah, exactly. I, and we, we can end on that point of like, we know what to do. It's just a matter of now f figuring out how to do it and the best way to approach it. Um, but listen, this has been a, a fantastic conversation and, and I'm really grateful for your time and for you sure. having come on the show. Where people can um, learn more about this stuff if they want to get involved, your company is called prosocial.world is the website. I'll put links in the description. Uh, you also have a host of books that I encourage people to read. Um, but what else would you like to you know, plug for yourself? Please do. Well, what I'll plug is, first of all, I have a comprehensive website of my work, which is called davidsloanwilson.world, so that's easy to remember. And then through ProSocial World, my nonprofit, we are working very hard to engage people. So if anyone is out there that says, wow, this is interesting, and they actually want to become uh, personally engaged, uh, we have a new group called the ProSocial Commons, the ProSocial Commons. And if you go to ProSocial World, then, uh, or I'll provide a link to an article on the ProSocial Commons. So if anyone is sufficiently inspired by this to actually want to get um, uh, involved and, and to learn more in a way that's uh, aligned with their interests, then uh, the ProSocial Commons is the group for you, and I will provide you with the link to, um, uh, to, uh, to provide. Shane, thank you very much. Yeah, great. And I encourage people to do that. Let's make the world a better place for everyone. All right. Thanks, David. We'll speak again soon. Okay. Take care.